Hi, Lillian. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> we'll just give it a couple of minutes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who's joining in. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes um, so that others can join in and then we will begin straight away. All right, we're two minutes past the hour, so I think we should begin and we'll uh, welcome other participants as they keep joining. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We are delighted as um, Mission 4.7 to present to you this session on uh, chatting with teachers. And uh, we wanted to do this because this is really where the, you know, when we talk about sustainable development and education for sustainable development, uh, the real action is in the classrooms. And so this is our attempt to get the classrooms into ICSD, and we hope that this will be an enjoyable session for you. Uh, I'm Chandrika Bahadur. I'm the director of the SDG Academy and uh, chair of the Mission 4.7 Secretariat. And I'm joined here by my co-host, uh, Julia Zimmerman, um, who will introduce herself right now. Julia, over to you. Thank you so much, Chandrika. My name is Julia Zimmerman, and I'm a program officer at the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, a quasi-international organization based in Vienna, Austria. We're also very proud to be members of the Mission 4.7 Secretariat and to have our co-chair Ban Ki-moon as uh, one of the patrons of Mission 4.7. It's very exciting to join you all today and to hear about all of your on-the-ground expertise teaching 4.7. Back to you, Chandrika. Thanks, Julia. Um, I thought we'd begin with uh, just a very quick uh, introduction of our panel. Uh, we're really delighted to have a stellar group of teachers with us. Um, I'm going to start in um, alphabetical order. So let's begin, uh, George, with you. Um, George uh, De La Cruz is uh, both a licensed nurse and a teacher. He's been in the teaching business for 18 years now. Um, and as a nurse as well, he served as clinical instructor and preceptor for 12 years um, and served as two-time faculty president of the STI West Nobros University College of Nursing. Um, he's also been faculty vice president at Central Philippine State University um, and Handovan National High School. And he sits as a board representative for the Balakod uh, City Public High School Federation. He's also a teacher and has received many awards, including most outstanding teacher District 4 Division of Bacolod City. George, welcome so much to the event. Yes, welcome. We Good are also everyone. We're also delighted to have with us Javiera Rana, who is an ESL tutor with 10 years of experience in developing lesson plans and curriculum for all students and accomplished ESL students in Pakistan and around the world. She has a master's degree in TESOL and an MPhil in ELT and is a trained uh, licensed Cambridge uh, trainer. Uh, she's worked with top schools in Pakistan, such as Beacon House, the City School, and Chantak School. She's also a STEM ED Fellow of the Jumki Basu Foundation in New York, a National Geographic Certified Educator, a Scientix Ambassador, a WLF Ambassador, and an Advocate for the Global Schools Program. Welcome, Javiera. Thank you so much, Chandrika. Thank you so much for this great introduction. Thank you. We're also delighted to welcome Lillian Olu from Kenya. Lillian, Lillian is an early years educator at Satam Schools, and she is also an alumnus of the SDG Academy in Education for Sustainable Development um, course, and she is uh, the president of the Kenya National Committee of the World Organization for Early Childhood Education, OMEP. In 2017, Lillian received commendation for special achievement in ESD from World OMEP, OMEP and in 2016, she actually was part of, the, uh, of, of a travel award to South Korea where her contribution uh, led to uh, OMEP's contribution to the UNESCO Global Action Plan. She's the founder of the Toy Library Association of Kenya and a board member at the International Toy Library Association as the Africa Link. Lillian, we're so delighted that you could join us. Thank you. 
And our final teacher is Santa Nair, who's an English teacher at a vernacular school in Perak, Malaysia. She was formerly the head of the English department and currently holds the position of head of the arts department. She's a master trainer for the Lower Perak district for the Sefer Aligned English Language Curriculum and has not only graduated in a bachelor's of teaching, but is currently doing her MBA in sustainable development management. What a wonderful combination. She is um, an alumnus um, of the Young Southeast Asian Leadership Initiative, and she attended their academy in 2016. Santa, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. All right, so that's our wonderful panel, a great amount of experience amongst all of you um, in different fields of education. So we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I thought what we do as a start is Julia and I will just give a little bit of an overview of Mission 4.7, which is the underlying framework which brings us all together. Um, and then we'll really dive in. Um, so just, just for everybody listening in and for all of you, Mission 4.7 is an initiative uh, that was launched last year in December 2020 at the Vatican um, in, in, the, in the presence of the Pope. It is essentially a, um, a mobilization and an advocacy effort to bring together leaders from around the world to push for achievement of SDG target 4.7, which as all of you know, is the particular target in the Sustainable Development Goals uh, Target and Indicator Framework that focuses on the need to educate our young people about sustainable development, about global, to help them become global citizenship, to the citizens, to teach them about culture, peace, nonviolence. Um, and uh, essentially it's a really powerful target that for us uh, emphasized everything that the SDGs stand for. And that is really why Mission 4.7 was launched to elevate target 4.7 and to help mobilize governments as as well as school systems to actually adopting this target and making it happen in their classrooms. So that's 4.7. We have two uh, patrons. We're very honored to have uh, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon as, as a patron of 4.7. And we're also honored to have the Director General of UNESCO, Ms. Audrey Osley, as the other uh, patron of 4.7. Uh, the initiative has four co-chairs, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, um, who's the president of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Ms. Stefania Giannini, who is the um, Assistant Director General in Charge of Education at UNESCO. Uh, Marcelo uh, uh, from uh, Marcelo Sorondo, who is the uh, President of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. And Tanshi Jeffrey Chia, who is the President of Sunway University in Malaysia. So we have a really wonderful spread out uh, uh, set of leaders leading this initiative, representing different aspects of multilateral organizations, academia, nonprofit. Um, and with them, we have mobilized a high level advisory group as well as um, an education task force comprising both um, leaders in the field, but also academics and technocrats who have spent uh, large parts of their career focusing on how to actually make this happen. So with that's that's the broad structure. We are a small secretariat. This is a joint initiative of UNESCO, the Ban Ki Moon Center, the Center for Sustainable Development, Columbia University, SDSN, as well as um, Sunway University. And so we will we are all banding together essentially to see how can we help you, teachers in the classrooms, promote these objectives. I'm going to turn it over to Julia to give a quick overview of the work that we do, and then we'll begin our discussion. Thank you, Chandrika. So this is a great overview of all of the different energy going into Mission 4.7 from so many different angles and ultimately to support teachers uh, like you in the classroom that you feel supported by policy and by materials to really be able to implement 4.7 um, on the ground. Uh, so Mission 4.7 has three main objective areas. So one is the advocacy area, another is guidelines, and a third is monitoring. And in the year 2021, 2022, the Secretariat has been pushing along with its members of the High Level Advisory Group and the Education Task Force, uh, particularly uh, the second objective has been a big focus for us, which is the guidelines and principles. We're working currently, and it will actually be soft launching uh, tomorrow already, a guidelines and principles for transformative education, which will also become a platform that can be used by teachers or by policymakers, educators around the world, 
to have a framework as well as a depository for resources on teaching um, SDG 4.7. So we really believe that this is going to be filling a necessary gap and something that uh, um, mem many members of the Secretariat of Mission 4.7 have been working very hard on. We also hope to have training modules this year for teachers, um, MOOCs, online training modules that really help make it more feasible to teach in the classroom, to integrate into current curricula for teachers on the ground, and also localization toolkits, because we understand that it's really important that these principles are localized. It can't be a one cookie cutter, one size fits all situation. It has to really be localized and specified for given scenarios. In the advocacy work, uh, this year was the, um, the, the Berlin Declaration on Education for Sustainable Development, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and Mission 4.7 has been very much championing this and working with UNESCO to promote the, the declaration. Furthermore, there will be additional uh, activities at the COP coming up where we're hoping to bring together ministers of education and environment to make further commitments to climate education, but also education for sustainable development and global citizenship education. So both that ESD and GCE or GCED, depending on how you use the acronym, that those are really taught in schools. Um, and lastly, in the monitoring, we're hoping to develop a policy tracker, as well as an index, um, using what already exists, of course, not reinventing the wheel, but trying to really, let's say, uh, streamline and prove it that it's really utilized um, by policymakers, but also supportive then of the teachers all the way down to the grassroots level uh, that this policy index exists. So that's about the work of Mission 4.7. We also are championing, of course, our members of the Education Task Force and the High Level Advisory Group and their work, which is quite uh, vast already. Um, so much is being done. Um, and a lot of it just needs to be brought into the spotlight. So that's what we're hoping to do as Mission 4.7. And with that, um, enough about us. We want to hear from you. Uh, that's the point of this session. Uh, and I would like to start already with uh, a question and maybe we'll turn it first to, to George for a response. And the question is, is describe through an example how you're teaching sustainable development, SDGs, global citizenship education to your students. How are you doing it? We'd love to hear. George, over to you. Hi. Uh, once again, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or whatever. Um, I believe in Nelson Mandela's statement that education is the most powerful weapon that can change the world. Yeah, I agree to that. Um, having SDGs integrated in the lessons surely makes an impactful and meaningful effect to the entire educative processes. And um, what actually are the many roles of education in uh, sustainable development? Its purpose is transformative in nature, in the sense that it should widen the world views, question and sustainability, and um, build competencies to address global challenges and be accommodated into global system. Beyond this education for sustainable development means integrating and uh, integrating the future as a specific dimension of our learning activities and teaching. How to build a sustainable future must play a central role in education processes. So therefore, all teachers and educators from different learning communities around the world must take the lead in order to achieve a more promising world for the future. Education for sustainable development um, seeks to equip learners with the knowledge, skills, and values, and competencies that actually contribute to the healthy and just economically viable and ecologically sustainable features um, for all. So to become more sustainable, we must um, recognize and respond appropriately to the complexity of interconnectedness of issues such as conflicts, um, poverty, wasteful consumption, environmental degradation, uh, climate change, um, urban population growth, gender inequalities and other human rights violations. So uh, the problem is that a significant number of us are apathetic about this and um, other sustainability issues. So even in the face of overwhelming evidence that many of our actions are negatively impacting our societies, economies and environment. So um, 
to foster sustainability, we need to rebalance individual and societal needs and wants. So for me as a teacher, I always integrate SDGs, a thematic approach in my lessons and through advocacy where I, um, I train my students um, case-based scenario, okay, where they analyze issues and um, how their roles um, play. So um, I think that's uh, challenging for us teachers and how to integrate SDGs in you know, a thematic approach. Thank you so much, George. So really using case studies, I think, as a way to, to make it very tangible for the students I'm hearing from you is, is really important for how you integrate. Great. Um, let's move on to, uh, to Santa. Could you share a little bit about, in your experience, how you're implementing this in the classroom? Well, is it possible I can share screen? I should love to show some pictures. Is that possible? Let's check with the, um, the technical team yeah. if you can allow sharing screen for Santa. Yeah, that should be no problem. You should be able to share right now. Thank you, Cheyenne. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. So if you, uh, just let me know if you can see. Okay, so uh, basically I have like, uh, thank you so much, first of all, to uh, you know for this uh, opportunity uh, speaking here for the first time at a big event. So it is amazing. So I use three main techniques to actually teach my children uh, because my school is a primary school and, you know, kids are really needed to be exposed to this kind of things. So what I used to do is I actually learn the curriculum first, learn the content. So even though I'm teaching English, I'm not only uh, teaching the language skills, but I also learn the content, whether it is suitable or not to be integrated with a the SDGs. The next part is I actually curate the lessons according to the content and the language skills. So what I've done here is like if you can look at our creature close-up games and then we had like internal scientists and speakers coming in like co-teach with us and to give these children exposure. Apart from that, uh, I go out and have experiences like from different uh, platforms, like from global schools, uh, from YC Lee, from Unite 2030. I learn how they actually teach adults in SDGs and I actually downsize the level and have a lot of post-it notes and design thinking sessions with the students. So if you can see here, like safety design thinking patterns, those are actually part of the topics that we have in the English syllabus. What we do is we chunk it up and, you know, put it in a bit size or like a diagram phase and talk about it. It enhances the speaking and uh, listening skill as well. Like for an example, like I have like food that I like, that is actually a year two, eight years old classroom where they actually talk about what fast food they love and you know those uh, vegetables or even fruits uh, those kind of topics but and then I take uh, them to a different scenario in the classroom speaking about is it easy for you to get food uh, you know is it difficult for you to get resources like like apples or you know vegetables for you to and so I hear like a lot of children tell me that uh, teacher I have like sometimes one meal per day and that is happening in a developing country like in Malaysia. So through the classroom, I actually provide them exposures like this. And we also talk about topics like uh, the climate change. Like today, I just uh, finished uh, speaking about the weather uh, for eight years old classroom. And, you know, uh, one student was asking me and teacher, uh, the, the, it's not snowing Malaysia. So what's happening in other countries if, you know, we have snows? So uh, basically, uh, I create the exposure within the content using the language skills because uh, my students are between from 7 to 12 years old. So it's more of gamification, um, exposing them to like, uh, they love colors. So I use a lot of colors in my uh, you know, content and exposing them to like uh, English language competitions, which related to SDGs. So my previous school actually was top five of um, the actions on competition where we solely uh, performed about the sustainable development goals. 
So if you can see that the box we actually created about the global goals, that was like a one week thing because we couldn't find most of it. So it's actually in the classroom and out of the classroom. And even though SDGs are very new to the students, so I expose the teachers. So uh, currently, recently this year, my team and I won actually a grant where we collaborated with 25 teachers to create environmental education playbook. Uh, thank you to British High Court Malaysia of uh, providing that grant. We actually curated lesson plans um, around these SDGs to actually help teachers and then for the students, the end product was all primary school students. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for these great examples, Santa. So the gamification of the, the SDGs and the topics related to the SDGs, also especially with young learners, I think this is really important that somehow you make it accessible to them at a young age. And it sounds like you're doing a really fantastic job of that. And congratulations as well on this playbook. This sounds really exciting. And I think many teachers will, will take advantage of that as well. Uh, next, I would like to turn to Javera Rana to also give some insights into how you're teaching in the classroom. Also, early childhood, I believe, especially, is, is your specialty. Um, um, well, early, not exactly early childhood. Actually, I, I teach primary as well as secondary. Thank you so much, Julia. <clears throat> actually, Mission 4.7 is all about transformative education. This is an education that will make our children lifelong learners and it will make them more empathetic citizens of the world who believe in more inclusion, more cultural diversity and equal opportunities. So if you if you just can allow me to share my screen and I'll take you guys, you know, a quick drive through what my students have been doing in the classroom in terms of lessons and project and everything. Can I just share my screen? Yeah, you should have access. Go ahead. Okay, so all my students, you know, it's it was like we decided upon that by we will be learning about uh, in 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 five months we will be implementing. Sorry, um, yeah. So it was a series of lessons that I did with my students, and by the end of this, which spanned over five months, we'll be work with a team to plan and conduct many social action projects, and also learning of SDGs and real implementation of SDG, ESD, and global citizenship in classroom and beyond. And also, I, I believe that, you know, when, when you set a target, it's very important to measure your success. So my students made it a point to evaluate the success of their social action projects in the end. So uh, what they did was they made groups and they selected the cause set the goal, research and plan, took action and evaluated. Um, from time to time, we can all feel that our world could be changed for the better. That was a decision. Our environment could be cleaner and our wildlife could be better protected. And then more could be done to end poverty in country, in, in, in Pakistan, especially in South Asia and overseas. And humans could live more peacefully together and promote global citizenship. So there could be more support for people going through difficult times. You know, many targets set. Because when, when people work together to tackle a problem in the world, we say that they are, you know, supporting a cause. I would like to take you guys through to my students' work quickly. So these are, you know, these are the pointers that my students actually made that what they will be doing. Reducing, reusing, recycling is, is very easy to do because we can start it, start it at the personal level. And quickly through this. So what they did was they not only interviewed experts, they, they made online reports, magazines, they surveyed people, they read a few books about it, documentaries, case studies, they search online. So what they did was they gathered a lot of source information to check what they can do. They even wrote letters to the Minister of Climate Change. Actually, Pakistan is fortunate. I think because uh, Pakistan is one of the countries that is very, very vulnerable to climate uh, change, one of the top 10, I believe. So we have a climate uh, ministry and the Minister Zirdaj Gul. My students actually wrote letters to the Minister of Climate Change. So 
you know, they also made behavioral changes, like, you know, not using the plastic bottles, not using the polythene bags, maybe taking, you know, a, a, a cotton bag to, for shopping, small things that will really start at the personal level. This is all reduce, reuse, recycle, and also repurpose. I would like to add into these R's. I think repurposing is also very important. They even did fundraising quickly through to the actual student work I want to take you guys. So, so you know, what my students actually decided in the end about all these documentaries and surveys and everything that they have a power and they have a voice, they can use it, not only to change themselves, but people in their house, in their communities, in the country and then beyond. So what they did was how they can use their voice and experiential learning to transform and make personal decisions that have an environmental impact. So this is my school actually doing reducing, reusing, recycle campaign and thinking green where, you know, make a card for your parents with suggestions on how to be a green consumer. That's, that's what they did. This is me demonstrating about climate change in the school, a conference that we did with the students. And this is students work. Now, what they did was, for this campaign, they use all discarded, you can see these newspapers, uh, newspapers and all the old discarded cotton boxes and chart papers and for the awareness drive. So this is all the recycled, recycled today for a better tomorrow. That's the wall they made in the school. You can see the students in action, you know, saving the planet. And this, this, this one is really very interesting because, you know, I, how my students actually knew that they have a voice and they have, that voice is very powerful. As a, I live in Pakistan in, in the province of Punjab. So they, they contacted the horticulture department of Punjab and what, what the government did was allotted my students a plot near the school where my, my students did the planting drive. Every student has a plant in their name and they actually go there and look after that plant. So you can see my students planting. <laughs> Then we then we talked about you know good health and well-being how important it is for my students to know how, what good health we, we all keep on saying that good health is important but then who is responsible for that good health you me society community who the doctors so you know it was important for my students to learn who was actually responsible and not only they understood what their duties are but what their responsibilities who has responsibility of doing what and the action they took was they, they you know, wrote letters to, um, because of the ongoing pandemic, you know how much uh, pressurized our um, medical facility is. So they, so, so they recorded messages on Flipgrid, thank you messages, you know, some, some moms, they baked cakes for them. And they also like sent postcards and letters to them. So the activity was very interesting. So how my students really incorporated it was they, um, you know, they had to write a health recipe and they a map for the walk and also instructions on how to create a, a fun, gum, fun game that is physical and so that their health can be better. This one is a float. Uh, this, is, this is beautiful. This, this float, we, you know, drove through the whole city. I live in Lahore city, the whole city of Lahore, where this is a campaign drive for not only climate action, but also global citizenship, peace and humanity. You can see humility, humility, you know, there were many posters. It was all created by school students. Then we had a lesson with global citizenship education where my students actually learn what global citizenship is and how they can do it, how they can be more inclusive is maybe, you know, contact schools overseas and do projects with students in, in, in other schools in the, in the world. And also like food security is very, no hunger is very important because Pakistan is one of the most food insecure countries in the world. And in the risking factor, it's ranking 11th. And there is another very surprising fact I would like to tell you is despite the fact of this insecurity, 40% of food wasted globally is in Pakistan. So this is, so this is the project. Uh, they were like how they chose their projects, the resources they need, the actions they want to do. They, they actually did the whole survey of. This is the experimentation part where they uh, to understand the temperatures, like how temperatures are rising. They uh, rising. They made hypotheses, observations, conclusions, and also thinking 
what is important is we have to think globally, but then act locally because everything has to begin, you know, like they say, charity begins at home. So such things also, they begin at home. They, they need to know how they can be more greener, how they can plant, how, how they can plant more, how they can be energy efficient in school and at home, how they can watch what they eat. Javier, this is really wonderful. You have so many wonderful examples. So I'm, I'm uh, just a poster. This yeah. is the Malala Yousafzai's poster that they, and just the poster, the climate pledges and the letters. Thank you. So there Thank were seven so much, projects yeah. actually did, did seven projects. Seven projects. Fantastic. So really seeing the, the actually coming into action. So the gaining the knowledge, gaining the awareness, and then actually taking action in these thinking globally, acting locally projects. This is really a fantastic example. Thank you so much for sharing all of these. That's great. And then Lillian, who actually is the childhood, early childhood, more specialist and enthusiast for ESD, I want to turn to you now to tell us our youngest learners how you're communicating about 4.7 in the classroom. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, this, this forum to share. Uh, my understanding of uh, early childhood is that of uh, an age group that is uh, very receptive to what is going on around them and also that is vulnerable to effects of any undoing with the, uh, the, the society as adults and everything that is going on around them. They bear the brand of everything that is happening around them. I look at sustainable development as a powerful tool uh, through which uh, these uh, values can be passed on to our young, young, youngest citizens. I call them youngest global citizens uh, because they are also a powerful segment of our society in terms of advocacy because they take it in, they are receptive, and they are also able to take it out as it is. And they are also... Um, take in what they believe in. So it is a, a good uh, group to work with in advocacy and anything that you are looking into bringing forward. Um, as I look at uh, the, the, the areas of sustainability, SDG and global citizens, I for sustainable uh, development, I tend to break it down into the three pillars and I tackle each pillar as it is for better understanding of these young learners. For example, um, when we look at the environment uh, pillar of uh, ESD, we explore the environment. I tend to open their eyes into the environment as it is. How have we endured? What do we have? What are the effects of our uh, practices around the environment? And uh, we are lucky as a country in our education sector to have our activity areas in every uh, level of education uh, coined to, towards ESD that gives us a room to practice this, especially the environmental activity area where we have a topic that is, is called entrepreneurship project, for example. Then we have animals and plants. So this gives us opportunity to study the environment much and also look at the entrepreneurship uh, uh, activities around us. So this brings in also the aspect of economic pillar. So under the economic pillar, we also look at uh, the, the economic activities that are done and we expose them to them. For example, they even go to uh, making bid work. They do art activities. When we expose them to the environment, we take them to the, we have uh, art projects, which they are also able to sell and make some little money and also in the process, they learn how to, to invest, they learn how to negotiate uh, for their prizes. They learn how to even put value on whatever products they come up with, because in the process of negotiation, you have to put a price tag and you have to uh, convince the buyer that this is going to be at this much because of a put in one, two, three. And they are also learning their value in terms of their skills. And also, as we look at the environment also, we open their eyes to scarcity, for example, uh, food insecurity and stuff like that, the 
coexistence around our environment, how we coexist with animals, for example, human to human, and we expose them to um, the, 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 the natural resources. Uh, for example, Kenya is a rich environment. Uh, we are blessed with tourism. So they need to know how the revenue is collected, how much of it. Uh, from from tourism. In the process, they get to know who are these tourists who come to our country, where do they come from? So they get interested to know which countries are they coming, what is their culture, for example? What do they do? Why do they come here? What don't they have or wherever they are coming from? So uh, we uh, I also uh, emphasize on uh, sustainable farming. We, we happen to live in an urban setting where the space is shrinking. There's a very little space, so not much farming can take place. But that, that doesn't mean that you go hungry because we are also looking at the SDG, the zero hunger, and all the areas that we are supposed to tackle. So there's always a solution to every problem. And we also need to think critically. So we open their mind into thinking critically on how to solve their problems. So I send them to, uh, we do some little farming, um, of sustainable farming within the classroom. And also this is extended at home. So they do this at home. They come up with their products, which sometimes is uh, exchange into some cash of some sort. As we look at um, the global uh, citizenship, uh, there's also the aspect of opening their eyes into the global arena, even as we act local. So uh, our curriculum also, our education system has national goals, eight national goals, which are very strong. And the first goal is on national uh, nationalism and patriotism. So we, we, I, I bring that into them, looking at the heritage, looking at uh, what we are endowed with as a, as a country, and also the goal number seven talks about uh, global consciousness and also appreciating other nations and respect for other nations. So in this manner, we also do beadwork. We also do artwork. Uh, the beadwork, we make bracelets, children make bracelets of uh, colors of different countries and uh, as, they, as they research on various countries of their choice and also particularly of Kenya. If I may just show, uh, share my screen a bit, just uh, in, uh, in a nutshell of what we do, I hope that is okay. Sure thing. So this is, um, on environment, as we were exploring the environment, we go to the literally to the woods and they look at what we have. They explore, they look at the coexistence within the environment and they study what is there. So at the end of uh, the excursion or the trip, they report on what they have seen. So this other one, they, they, have, they, they make animals. Uh, with leaves and the materials that they collect from the environment, just to connect the co coexistence around. And uh, on matters scarcity, because uh, this is why the sustainable development or education is there, because of the challenges that we've had in, in, in our existence. So we, as we look at scarcity, they also explore ways of tackling this issue because if we cannot afford to buy materials, I'm a play advocate and I encourage a lot of play, but how do we do this with scarce materials? So they have to develop this from the available, locally available resources that are also perceived as waste. So they make materials, play materials that will enable their play, which we also call sustainable play because it has to continue. Play will never stop and learning also has to go on. So we have to come up with materials made from, uh, they make them themselves, we make them together and they continue with their learning and their play. Um, I also- Lillian, their, I'm, yes? I'm very sorry to cut this short or maybe you can give one more example just because I'm conscious of time and then we'll move on to the next question but these are really fantastic. So okay. maybe one more example and then we'll move on to the next. Okay, uh, another one is uh, on a celebration of uh, international global days. For example, like today is a international uh, day of peace. 
we also look at that and tie it to the conflicts that we have because the idea is to minimize or even stop conflicts and violence at all. So we look, we explore that in terms of environment because environment uh, forms a big percentage of our conflict because of the shrinking space and resources that we have. So we we encourage I encourage them into uh, finding solution, tree planting, uh, finding peace, re recycling, reusing, and all that to minimize and to uh, on violence by providing more materials and more resources, enough resources for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian, and just proof to show that it's never too young to learn about these topics and to also challenge young people to think even entrepreneurially about how they can fund projects and make something uh, sustainable efforts. It's really fantastic. I'm going to pass back over to my co-moderator, Chandrika, for the next question. Thank you, Julia. And can I just echo what a fantastic and inspiring set of examples you've given us. Uh, you know, you are, all of you are um, obviously exceptional at this, but you're also in a minority. Most teachers in the world do not put in the kind of effort and time and energy that you've put in into your classrooms. Um, and, and, you know, it is, it is a challenge. So just from your perspective and everything that you've done and seen around you, what are the two things that you think need to change so that um, something like... Uh, uh, the SDGs, uh, global citizenship 4.7 can be taught in classrooms. So two things, one from the perspective of the classroom. So what is it that teachers need to do differently? That is the first question. And then the second is in the system, in the education system, what needs to change that could allow teachers to be more effective in classrooms? And we'll do a reverse this time. So Lillian, let me start with you. Um, and ask you if you could give us uh, two of your thoughts on uh, what would really help us succeed. Well, thank you so much. I'll start with the classroom as a teacher, uh, based on the practice that I've had and uh, based on even the reaction within uh, the, the, the colleague setup. This requires one to go beyond the, the, the comfort zone and to put in an extra, go an extra mile in terms of practice so that all this can be achieved. And it seems like too much work. Uh, the first uh, uh, thing that needs to change is that teachers need to expand the learning space. That one has to happen. Learning should be taken beyond the, the, the confines of the four walls of a classroom. And it is important that teachers utilize the outdoor space um, uh, uh, going by the word of uh, one educator that uh, the best classroom is one that is roofed by the sky. And uh, the, in, uh, in the outdoor, there's so much to learn about because this uh, bring, engages all their senses and children are engaged and they're able to observe, they're able to analyze, they're able to make decisions based on what they're seeing and based on all their senses. So it is important that the learning space is expanded and that the teachers look beyond the syllabus. Uh, uh, we are, we are uh, living in a world where it's competitive. It's, it's really competition of, uh, of, of, of results, of exams, exam oriented and stuff like that. And this minimizes the space and the practices for the teacher. So if the teacher is able to look beyond the syllabus and expand and explore all these other approaches, it would be a rich classroom with a complete uh, set of outcomes that we are looking for. In as far as the government, I mean, the, the, the education system is concerned, uh, I would look at uh, a shift away from exams also, because this is a policy that comes from the government. So the education should respond to the new trends uh, the new challenges, for example, emerging issues and potential challenges. These are challenges that have not come, but we are seeing the potential of them occurring. If, if the education system would constantly look at potential challenges and look at the emerging issues and look at the, um, the, the new trends and focus on equality, focus on promoting peace and uh, nurturing global citizens, then we would have a rich form of uh, education for these children. Excellent, really helpful and really, I think, insightful comments. Uh, let's turn to Javiera. Okay, so um, 
See, I believe that, uh, it, you know, we can use all the fancy words that we wanted to use, but then really it has to start, let's say, at the grassroots level, like Lenin also said, that right there at the kindergarten level. See, children, it's very easy. Children, children can connect to their own needs and their own rights better. So what we can do is we can start telling them about their rights and then their responsibilities, then eventually human rights and then gender equality and then global citizenship. It's really as easy as that. We have to empower our students to be leaders. They have to stop and think about the world around them. Mm. See, because you know, if, for the we must instill in their young hearts and minds the importance of lifelong learning, and for that there needs to be a shift from the like. Also, Lillian, I I totally agree with Lillian when she says that we need to make a shift from the exam or only exam oriented and result oriented studies towards a skill development and concept based inquiry our curriculum needs to be more flexible more inclusive and global teaching practices should involve collaboration communication with educators globally and on the classroom level we can um, what we can do is we can encourage our children to read books about citizenship we have to give them a free hand and opportunity where they can you know, write prose or poems, be a free writer, maybe draw, paint, posters, you know, discuss about how different books, characters display citizenship. We, they, can, uh, they can also, we can give them opportunities to work on projects that involve other schools um, in, in other countries. When it comes to the government and the system of education on a broader level, every country, which is a signatory of the Berlin Declaration that was adopted in May 2021, should keep it as the guiding chart for forming national curriculums because every national curriculum should aim to develop a sense and an awareness of the interconnectedness among people, societies, environments around the globe. Let's be honest, like the saying goes, you know, this is, this is that we have no planet B, this is the one we have. So, so to live together with peace and harmony, you know, to thrive on it, to dwell on it, our students are our agents of change. When students develop mm -hmm. a sense of global citizenship, they will learn to respect the seminal universal values such as peace, equality, equity, lifelong learning opportunities, sustainability, and upholding the human rights and dignity of all people. So the government needs to revise its policy, be more flexible, you know, and stop the rigid, the rigid curriculum that we have. Yes. Yeah, excellent. So I think there's, there are clear themes coming out from, uh, from both of your interventions. Um, let's continue the discussion and turn to, to Santa, if you can uh, uh, give us also one example of what should change in the classroom and one system wide. Well, if you see like many teachers who teach SDGs in classroom, they are alone. And I would tell you, you are not alone because you are the drive, you are the change maker, you learn about the SDGs and you're doing it for your students. Think that your attitude has to change. Why in the first place? Why are you an educator in the first place? And think about how you were as a student before. Your children in this classroom, your students are in the classroom, want to see exemplary teachers. And you were students before, and you had the experience of having good teachers and bad teachers. I would say it out loud here. Why can't you be that good teacher? and you know create the change even if you are one person in the school create that sdg environment the classroom be there with the ecosystem of sustainable development and global citizenship in the classroom with your students you create that i know teachers like you know due to covid and those kind of things we complain about a lot of work but if you really want your students to learn to be better leaders later who's going to you know create policies for us when we grow old, you need to give them the platform today. It, it's, it's, it, it's an ongoing process. And speaking about the uh, policy and the government, I would encourage governments out there, how many teachers are there actually having a seat in the policy making structure? How many teachers out there is given the seat to actually say a word hey, I want this in my policy and this is going to be beneficial for primary schools, secondary schools, tertiary level. How many teachers out there are actually given the seat in policymaking? And I echo what Lillian and Javera were saying, but if we are only going to be you know, in our cocoon, teaching at schools and not given the platform to go beyond, 
we tend to deviate out of the government. We tend to find like, you know, SDSN, uh, you know, SDG Academy, even this one to, to you know, for to allow our voice to be heard. If our government is not supporting us, if there is, yes, you know, give us the platform, we want to do more. So attitude one side and giving us the seat the other side. Yeah. Excellent, very important. And this is a message that we will for sure uh, take into our uh, work moving forward. Um, let me turn to George now. George, um, over to you. One thing to change in the classroom and one systemic change. I think it's all about connectivity uh, for like bringing school uh, closer to the community. So as a teacher, you should be equipped with uh, the concepts about SDGs. You should, it should start within yourself and uh, in such a way that you are able to, um, to convey the message to the community. In my case, um, I have this um, school organization and I was able to inject to them the SDG concept where we, uh, we were able to come up with a community-based project. So we, um, we uh, adopted one community here uh, closer to our school where most of our students reside. Um, as a history, uh, we were able to put up Project Basura or Project Trash, um, where most of um, the recipients are mothers of our students. So uh, we call it uh, Scavenger Mothers uh, because uh, it is in Barangay Felisa. And this Barangay Felisa is the host, um, is our city's host for uh, sanitary landfill or dam site, where most of our students' uh, mothers are doing the scavenging in order to support their daily needs no, in our school. So um, applying the principle of research, since I am teaching research, I was able to come up with this program and um, uh, applying SDG concepts through my club. And we were able to establish the, the mothers. We were able to organize them. And we came up this um, upcycling livelihood program. And uh, we trained them. We partnered with um, with training uh, institutions like the Department of Trade and Industry. And finally, we were able to, um, to receive a fine grant with that for that, you know, for their livelihood. And we were able to come up um, projects like Project Dolls or um, Mascara Dolls, yeah, out of the waste. So we were able to come up with uh, other crafts, products, and um, other forms of livelihood like food production, food processing as a proceed of their um, 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 earnings no, out of the of, out of the proceeds. So George, this teacher, is a great example of what can happen inside the classroom. But if you look at the system of education in the Philippines, what do you think needs to change? I think uh, literally nothing has to change, but I think to revisit or modify some of the curriculum aspects because here uh, SDGs is not much of really a concern for each teacher here. So that's why I said that it should start with a teacher. Like in my case, I really um, I allowed myself to be trained with, uh, with the Global Schools program where I was able to devise my own tool and I was able to come up with a unified learning action matrix where uh, this is a two pronged approach where um, as my guide, as my rubric, I was able to, to integrate uh, SDGs and global citizenship education. And later on, uh, it has been adopted here in our division um, where um, learning area supervisors uh, were trained and later on, uh, just recently, we have our inset or in-service training uh, where um, the entire division of, of Bacolod City where close to 8,000 teachers in the workforce, teaching force, uh, were able to avail of that training through our division office. Wonderful. So I think, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's high time for us to, to uh, really not just teach, but really to advocate SDGs and not just only to integrate the, the concept, but really to, to lead the pack as teachers, as educators of the world, we really need to advocate out of the confines of the four corners of, of our classroom. So through advocacy, we can integrate a lot of projects. Uh, yeah, applying the principle of bringing school to the community, we can integrate SDGs. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. So go to the Thank community. You. That's the lesson from, from uh, George. Um, we are rapidly running out of time. Uh, so we will uh, wrap up this discussion. We're going to do a little bit of a rapid fire round here. Um, and we're going to go around to all of you and ask you to, in under uh, two sentences, uh, tell us one piece of advice that you would give to a teacher who is listening in and who maybe wants to do this, a teacher who's maybe a little bit indifferent, um, or a teacher who's just too burdened with, uh, with their ongoing workloads to uh, be able to do it, even if they cared. Um, so just your, you know, things that you wish you would have, somebody would have told you when you started on this journey. Um, we're gonna start, uh, Santa, with you. Um, so as I said, it's gonna be rapid fire. You have two sentences, go. All right. Uh, I would say if BTS can make it to the UN, you also can make it to the UN teachers. So I'm uh, uh, creating a white paper currently and rebooting the education system uh, post pandemic. So it has given us all the opportunities. So if anyone of you wants to create that solution together, you can join me. But a simple thing, if BTS can make it, why can't all of your teachers? So yeah. Great. Javiera. My advice is actually just one sentence, but I'll just elaborate it into two sentences. My advice is teachers, educate yourself and others. Because there's a Chinese proverb that if you're planning for a year, you know, you sow rice. If you're planning for a decade, plant trees. If you're planning for a lifetime, educate people. Please, teachers, give your time, skill, commitment to educate yourself, your colleagues, peers, friends teachers, community about shared global goals of Mission 4.7. Get informed about them, please. Explore the realities of global goals and what they mean for your country and for the whole planet. Yes, thank you. Excellent. Lillian. Uh, I, I would tell teachers, uh, please teach for future, teach for sustainability. Is it just me? Lillian seems to have, uh, we seem to have lost her connection. On. Lillian, you're back. We lost okay. you for a bit. So you can say it again. Okay, I'll, I'll tell teachers to teach for future, teach for, uh, for, for sustainable future, teach the values, uh, cohesion, uh, human uh, humanity, human rights, focus on the needs and potential future needs. And that Excellent. we will get it right. Excellent. George, you have the final word in under a minute. Yes. Uh, as teachers, you must be an advocate. You must have a character for a kid. So what is this character for a kid? C, compassion to teach. H, heart for and love for teaching. A, advocate for SDGs. And R, respect for your, for your learners. A, advocate for G said. And C, cultural-based education. T, temperament to teach. E, enthusiasm to teach, and R, reliable, reflective, reciprocal as a teacher for kids to know, imagine, and do it by themselves. So teachers must have the character for a kid. Excellent. What a wonderful summing up. So that brings us to the end of a really, really fascinating and inspiring discussion, I think, to hear uh, straight from the classrooms to see all the wonderful work that all of you are doing and really to give us... Um, uh, give us so many ideas and hopefully to give our audience so many ideas. So I'm going to turn it over to Julia uh, to help us close um, and uh, uh, really go back with some fantastic memories of this session. Julia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you everyone um, for our wonderful speakers today and for sharing these incredible examples of your work, your feedback on areas where it can improve in the classroom and in policy, but also your advice for other teachers. I think it's really inspiring. I know a few teachers are definitely listening today and I hope they really take this to heart. You all represent incredible leaders in the education space in your own right. And the fact that you've taken the opportunity and the initiative to really educate yourselves, educate others, um, and, and platform these important ideas that, that cannot wait, must be taught now to all ages across the lifespan, developing lifelong learning as, as a passion for young people is, I think, is really a remarkable thing to do as a person. So 
I, I will just echo what you said before your advice for other teachers again, because I think it was just so lovely, all of them. So if BTS can do it, so can you from Santa. Uh, teachers, educate yourself and others. This was very good one from Javiera that it's, it's important to be able to educate yourself and others. Uh, teach for the future, Lillian, that this is really important, and George, to um, be advocates as a teacher. So all of you are just that, and I thank you very much for, for sharing your insights today, and I hope that everyone takes, takes it with them into the rest of, of their teaching and lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned for ICSD uh, tomorrow. Thank you.